I'm Andy Irwin, and this is The Storytellers. Today, we're going to explore the world of blurry. And for those that are uh, rabid fans, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you that don't, you're about to get a treat. Um, you know, I think there's this universal fascination with certain mythical creatures on Earth, whether it's, you know, Loch Ness Monster, you know, uh, aliens, different things like that. But really, the, one of the biggest fascinations is Bigfoot. And uh, you kind of probably asking yourself questions like, what does that have to do with storytellers? Well, the two individuals that I'm having on the podcast today are storytellers that caught me off guard when I heard about them. I just heard more and more people talking about this podcast uh, called Blurry Creatures. Now, you got to check it out. And I'm a skeptic. And so I just, you know, it, it, it takes me a while to kind of catch on. But I, I, I couldn't get away from it. And when I stumbled onto it, it is fascinating. The, and the two guys that host the show uh, are equally fascinating. One comes out of the, the world of rock music and is a uh, former lead singer for a band. The other comes from sports uh, royalty, uh, and his family is synonymous with the game of football. And so the two of them started this podcast around the idea of Bigfoot. So I uh, can't wait to dig into it, but then to look at like the purpose behind why they do what they do. It's fascinating. So today on the show, would you please welcome my guests, Nate Henry and Luke Rogers, the hosts of Blurry Creatures. So Blurry Creatures, I kept hearing about it over and over again. People were like, and I'm, I'm usually like a late adopter. So if everybody is saying you've got to do this, I zig the other way. I'm like, no, Good uh, for you. I'm not. That's yeah. not You're me. like, I found the band yeah, first. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Everyone listen to it. Everyone <laughs> no, listen to it. No, yeah. no, exactly. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. But everybody I kept hearing uh, about, you got to check out Blurry Creatures. And then my wife starts talking about it. And I'm like, I'm like, what the heck? You don't even like aliens or any of this stuff. And she's like, no, 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 but Blurry Creatures. And then my pastor, Darren, starts talking about it. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And then I start checking you guys out. It's like a phenomenon. Like, tell me a little bit about, like, just the background of your podcast. It's, it's a podcast that is really out of the box. But, like, tell me a little bit about what, what Blurry Creatures is for the people that haven't caught on it's kind of like all the taboos topics that you know people sort of off the you know aliens bigfoot giants uh alternate history yeah. we we get into all the subjects that there is a lot of data to support that you know there's there's a lot of data around sasquatch for example right. and that's where the show started we started talking about bigfoot but from like a biblical perspective like okay <laughs> that's amazing yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and and you know Part of the reason the podcast started was because there was a lot of theologians that were starting to talk about these things. And then you realize there's a pocket of them from, you know, from Chuck Missler, who was one of the, like the pioneers, of pastor talking about abductions and aliens and greys, UFOs, right. um, like really what was going on in the golden age, the Old Testament. It wasn't, you know, this, it was more of a sci kind of a sci-fi story. Huh. And, you know, I think um, it, it just kind of grew. Um, out of the Sasquatch thing, and then you kind of follow every episode to the next episode. So I think at first we were we were thinking it was just going to be kind of more of a Bigfoot show, yeah, right. And then all of a sudden, it's it, this whole universe that comes yeah, out of it, the blurry verse, we right? Call it. Yeah, you the thought ahead, though. so Nate. I mean, Nate to his credit thought ahead, and it, we didn't brand ourselves as a Sasquatch show because in some ways that would have pigeonholed us, right? Yeah, right. And so it became sort of this creature space becomes a wide lane. You can actually sort of veer off this highway, yep. if you will, with that with that analogy into other spaces. And so you know, if you go all the way back, you know, Nate had a podcast before Blurry Creatures and so did I. Um, Nate had a, had a show with with a friend, with a mutual friend of ours who was in the band world yep. and they they had a variety show. And I had a variety show with my brother, it was sports related, it was called Sports Related. Yeah. Which was, um, I like puns. So, uh, <laughs> but we did that for about 30 episodes and then, then retired that and Nate, was remodeling houses, doing doing gutting around his own house and flipping houses as, as post band world for him, and um, listen to I'm stealing your story, but listen to like ten thousand was like ten thousand hours of of, <laughs> he, of, podca of, of podcasts and and when you're working alone, I'm gonna tell your story for you. I have heard this right. a lot. That's right. <laughs> All right. When you're working alone, you, you know, judge him on how he does it. I, he yeah, he yeah, wanted like, to find something that wasn't overly political or you know sports based because those things kind of get old at some point. Right. And he found. Nate found something in Sasquatch. That, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but in 2020, I, I've given up doing uh, 
New Year's resolutions because they're disappointing yeah. at the end of the yeah. day. Because you, yeah, I don't make it through the day with no, you know, before no, I'm no. broken. Yeah, yeah. No, so I make I started making a list, and that that year I was like, I want to I want to do another podcast. I had this idea for this, my my own podcast idea, right. and then Twitter being um, the ultimate, you know, public square. I think I tweeted about Bigfoot and Nate. Nate, who I knew, we'd known each other from. You the, guys knew each other because you were in the loosely it, from the band days, like friends of yeah. mine and people from Chico, from where I grew up in Northern California, and a played in Nate's band. Yeah. And also, yeah. Nate had played shows with my best friend um, growing up, who had a band called Number One Gun. Yeah, I had, we had kind of had like just this, these these like two six degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, right. you know, we had this. Hey, look at that. That's good. That's yeah, a good yeah, one for this yeah. show. <laughs> it all leads back to Kevin Bacon. I, right. I, I think the thing that's interesting is for like. I mean, you were you were you were a lead singer in a band, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, and the Rogers family is obviously synonymous with you know with sports with your brothers Aaron and Jordan, and you guys doing the podcast. So all of a sudden, there's a there's a tweet about Bigfoot, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. that <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, the podcast. I think when we were just starting. Um, we didn't have a website to like 35 episodes, yeah. so <laughs> we didn't come out of the gate like trying to to, to be something. Yeah. yeah. It who, just happened. Who, who, who came up with the name Blurry Creatures? Was that because yeah. that's like the the best, most marketable name I've ever heard? Like <laughs> hey, it's fantastic. There you go, Nate. Thanks. And so you came up with that? Yeah, I came up with it. Um, you old boy. I with a cool logo too. Thanks. Like you do the you he had it logo ready. I had a buddy. He had it all okay. ready. Yeah. When I said yes, he's like, "Well, here's the media package." <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "Oh, this is great." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's like the band world taught me. You yeah. know. Um, because every band that was big in our space was really well branded. Most of yeah. them had logos. Most of them even had, you know, a certain font with their name. And then you're constantly packaging merch with your brand, right. and you're selling, and there's flyers. And so I came from a heavy, heavy marketed mm -hmm. environment. So I knew, you know, I want to get the .dot com. And as soon as I went to BlurryCreatures.com .dot com and it was available, I'm like, this is it. It was, I don't know, a little inspiration, a little luck. All the above. So you know, I want to get to like some of the some of the why and what to what you guys do because I think that's really powerful too. But just just to kind of get out some of the style out of it, uh, Bigfoot. Like, what what's your obsession with Bigfoot? Why why Bigfoot? Um, you know, coming out of the band life, um, I was with guys all day long. We were talking about all kinds of things. So lots of there was a couple of philosophy majors in my band. So we talked about theology a lot. We talked a lot about. We had these conversations all day long on the road. And then when I got off the road, I was kind of by myself a lot and I just podcast kind of became a friend. And I, I don't know, I think I started watching some shows on TV and then got into like some coast to coast stuff and then missing 411. And it was kind of like before true crime became a thing. Um, it was sort of the same kind of vein. It was like Sasquatch is out there. You have cops, you've got military, you got all these right. people coming on these podcasts that are kind of new talking about encountering this thing and you know it's funny because i actually have a memory i worked i worked at a camp in college called mount herman mm -hmm. of all places which mm -hmm. is you know people who were fans of the show know that yeah according to the book of enoch mount herman is yep. where angels and humans kind of yeah nephilim yeah, yeah created the giants um but they they had this sasquatch footprint off off the beaten path huh. and this was in like the redwood fords forest in northern california and i remember being a kid and going on the way to the pool you had to hike down this trail through the redwoods and there was like this footprint that was like a like the legendary sasquatch right footprint. and it was made out of wood and i was probably like five years six years old i remember taking some of my buddies like look that's where bigfoot was and i had this memory a couple months ago kind of came back to me out of nowhere and i i was asking my siblings like do you remember that do you remember and they're like no and i'm like i felt like god kind of gave me this memory of you were a little kid. Yeah. You were interested in Sasquatch even then, and right. you were at this place called Mount Hermon, which is, you know, such a random mountain to pick for yeah. a, for like a Christian camp. So, so I haven't heard this story. Yeah, that's, that's the so first cool. time for me. That's here. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I got a scoop, and uh, I, it just came back to me one day while I was kind of working on some stuff, and I felt like it was something that was just a cool memory of kind of how it all started. So, um, you know, Northern California is like Sasquatch country. Yeah. And it's just the right amount of mystery. It's just uh -huh. the right amount of weird. And there's a lot of data around it. Right. So when you get past all the like tabloid yeah, sure. Sasquatch stuff, you realize, oh, wait, there's like, there's a lot here. And I was interested in it for, from, from a distance for, for years. Yeah. But then guys like Dr. Michael Heiser and some of these theologians started coming on saying, well, this could be related to the Genesis 6 event. And I'm, yeah. I'm like this Christian kid, Christian camp, Campus Crusade, huh. Young Life. 
you know, multiple churches, went to a Christian school, like played in the Christian band, played in the yeah. quasi Christian band, and yeah. then, and then like, wait, what? <laughs> Genesis six? It's you know? like the best gift you could give yeah. like a Christian yeah. kid. Be like, I can do both. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of you this whole own world unlocks, and that's kind of like, okay, we got to start a podcast. And it was just, you know, there was a lot there, but Sasquatch is just this weird. You know, of all the sort of the cryptid creatures, the monsters in the woods, Sasquatch is, the reports are all over the place. Uh -huh. Sometimes he's like your friend in the woods gifting you things. And then sometimes it's like terrifying. So yeah, it's, it's a really what, strange creature. What, what, one of the things that happened, and go with me on this, but like <clears throat> after, you know, I'm a skeptic, like I said, and I, you know, I kind of come into things always with, you know, yeah. kind of a, you know, prove it type mentality. But after, you know, digging into y'all's podcast and beginning to kind of uh, consume it and, you know, and then starting the friendship with you guys, uh, this thing happened a few weeks ago with uh, my daughter has chickens. And so she has like 12 chickens. They're, they're pets. They're not anything but pets. And in the middle of a thunderstorm, it was right after a heat wave had come through. My, my daughter goes out to check on the chickens. And in the middle of the thunderstorm, I hear this wailing and crying. And I'm like, oh, crap, what happened? So I go out and one of the chickens had had a heat stroke and died. And so my daughter is like, comes in, everybody's crying, my wife's crying. And I'm like, she's like, you got to bury the chicken. And I'm like, I'm like, babe, I'm not going to bury the chicken on her property. A coyote's going to dig it up. And, and, you know, and she's like, she was like, well, it's in the garage in a garbage bag. We got to figure out what to do with the chicken. I was like, fine. And then my daughter is like, you have to treat it with respect. I've made a custom, we're artists. So she makes a custom headstone with his name on it. And she's like, she's like, you got to go do it with flowers. So I'm like, I'm like, I tell, I tell Mandy, I'm like, well, okay, fine. I'll take it to my office. There's woods out in the back. I'll take it out in the woods. I'll bury it, have a little burial site for this chicken and it'll be done. What I didn't take into account was by the time I got here to the office, it was dark and the, and the thunderstorm starts again. And so, so I'm like, I'm like, but I'm like, I'm a good father. And I'm trying to explain the security camera footage to my staff of why I'm going in with this bag that looks right, like right, a head yeah, in it yeah. and a shovel. And I'm going out back to dig a hole. So I go out in the woods and I'm out, out in the woods. The thunderstorm starts. It's dark. Nobody's around. And I'm digging this thing and I'm putting a chicken in it with like, and I was like, what if Nate and what if Nate and Luke are right? What if Bigfoot is real? <laughs> like if you're at holding food. I've like I was like, and I've got oh, yeah, I've got like a chicken sacrifice to Bigfoot. And I'm like, darn those guys. Like, like it ruined me. It was literally the scariest moment of my life. I was like sitting there, like, what am I doing? Dude, I'm, I would have never I'm thought food, I'm about holding it. food. Yeah. <laughs>really fascinated me about what you, your brand is we were talking i was like what makes your show tick and you said it's it's interesting topics that have a biblical mythology to it uh it's not taking ourselves too seriously and it's 80s nostalgia mm -hmm. so like why 80s nostalgia and like what are the stories out of the 80s that inspire and fuel the show it was funny from from the get-go i found this song by this artist time cop and it's just kind of like it's just it starts with like some synth and then it builds yeah and um i emailed them i said hey can we use this for the podcast and uh -huh. i think it'll be like the theme song at the end and i think it's that song that really gave huh. me the idea like we should just do all we should just like try to make this just embrace it yeah embrace the 80s vibe. And then we're kids of the 80s right so yeah right. exactly it's it's something about that era but you know that's where we grew up there's there's this like ah, there's familiarity there's this time before phones there's this time where you could ride off on your bike and your BMX with your pals, and it was like there was mystery, and, uh -huh. and maybe you, your parents couldn't find you for yep. say, like, not that you'd want that necessarily, but there's something about maybe the innocence and sort of, and for us, I know that that there's just there's a lot attached to those to the, that time, the films, the you know the Karate Kids and Ferris Bueller's, all these things that kind of are built into your your requisite psyche, if you will. Of it, it just is a it's it's kind of a fun thematic mm -hmm. for for what we're doing, and I, and I think as Nate said, when he when he found this song, and we we're like, hey, we could do this as an '80s theme. It just it just fit. It kind of yeah. Fit. yeah. There was a lot of like, and there was a lot of people that take they take it a little too serious, or they brand kind of bad, or they. Yeah. And I think it was just more fun and more yeah. fun. Yeah. You know, I I heard Tom DeLong recently talk about like you know, grew up with like you know, Blink One Eight Two, and he's in alien space mm -hmm. and stuff, and he said something that really resonated with me that 
it's one thing to make a record, make a piece of art, right? But the real art is making your art accessible to people, mm. and that's when the real job begins. Mm. Because you can any musicians can go down and sit down and make a record, right? But nobody knows you made it, mm. and nobody knows how to relate to the thing you made. And I thought about that. I said that's probably one of the things that I've that I just naturally always think is the most important part. Mm. Yeah, let's make this podcast. Let's edit it as best we can. But let's market the heck out of it mm -hmm. in a fun way that gets everyone excited about it. And I think that's just what the band world taught me. Yeah. Make this fun for everyone. And I, I watched a lot of bands who did that. Mm -hmm. They sort of had this cult following. Everyone loved them. Sure. They, they, they made it like you were in the band. You were with them. So I think we tried to do that with the podcast. 80s was just like an easy way to do it. And and it was fun. We we remake a lot of memes. We we'll take like the Princess Bride and make him talking about Genesis six and stuff. And <laughs> I didn't but know I, think, I was gonna be a voice actor. I think the other thing too, yeah, yeah exactly. I think I the, other, the other thing too is that you know when you maybe unintentionally too for us the place this podcast has taken us, you get into some very dark spaces. Right? Yeah, and so oh yeah, I think there's a a levity that and kind a, of balances. Yeah, and there's it. an approachable juxtaposition there of like of like let's not take ourselves too seriously and let's have fun and let, let, let's. Uh, Let's do some funny things around around this, but then at the same time, let's address some very let's address the darkness, right? It's just you know, this Ephesians six thing. Let's expose and address the darkness, and, and I think that is a balance, as you say. There's there's a balance there. I think that works, um, and I think some of that is us just wanting to have fun, and some of it is sort of we stumbled into that, and it work it works well, yeah, and then yeah. and then it, but there's an intentionality as well mm -hmm. to like. You know, how do you balance hmm. things like satanic ritual and yeah. demonology yep. and all the darkness with the, something that, that feels approachable? And then to, to wrap that in the end, we always try at least try to come back to the hope that that exists because of the work of Christ, right? And that's the and I know we're gonna get into this, but I, I think that's what when we started this podcast, we wanted it to be a reflection of us. And Nate and I are both Christians, and so the idea was always like how do we address these things that are weird and on the fringes from a, you know, from, from the view of the Bible and also from the view of our faith, you know, because I do think that, that the, ch the church by and large doesn't want to address some of the things we talk about. Yeah. And, and it just, it, because they're uncomfortable or even the Genesis six view that, that it's easy to skip over those four verses because mm -hmm. they're really uncomfortable, like to, you know, angelic, you have this angelic yeah. human mixing and, and this hybridization, which was of course, the belief for hundreds of years after Christ, even, I mean, thousands of years before that, and then hundreds of years up until it was massaged into what, you know, to the Seth view. We're not going to do theology too much, but I know it's fascinating, but I, I think, I think we wanted to approach this all from a, from the foundation of our faith mm. and how to contextualize this stuff, right? Mm. Like how do you contextualize ghosts? How do you talk about the alien phenomenon, right? In which, you know, great timing for us this last year and has been yeah. crazy in like that, that space, that, right? That, the, the Reno Nevada video or whatever. Yeah, that, 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 and, like and then over crazy. House and Oversight then, Committee's and then, and having, releasing all the information. Congress is having meetings on the House Oversight Committee crazy. about UAPs and there's whistleblowers and looks like there's going to be disclosure, all this stuff. And also we grew up in kind of like really cheesy Christian marketed yeah. stuff. <laughs> and, and I mean, sure you guys come up with this. It's really yeah. hard to you know, have media, have yeah. music, have movies, podcasts, but not branded in a way that's like, and I think for Luke and I, like, we didn't want to feel like a church. We didn't want to, you know, I was just like, I want to brand this just like a rock band, yeah. but kind of a band that doesn't care about what anyone thinks, mm. but also, you know, the gospel is going to be presented yep. and we're going hundred miles an hour and take it or leave it so i think a lot of people come in thinking oh this is just gonna be a paranormal show this is gonna be like right. this is gonna be like weird stranger things-esque but then they hear the gospel and i've always felt like the gospel stands on its own i don't i don't need I to like that. i don't need to do anything yep. it is it is a powerful message i just need to be myself and i think you know we coming out of the band world we just we didn't want to be cheesy <laughs> yeah but I, but we you know and i also think that like the the existence of the things some of the things we talk about whether it be bigfoot or ufos aliens and stuff like I, I would say there's a, a large majority of Christians that, that believe those are disqualifiers for whatever reason. Yeah. Right. All of a sudden that disqualifies your faith. We, we can't fit this in our worldview because yep. this is just. But, th but there's also like a power to it that like when you, 
when if you if you do believe that the gospel stands on its own, yeah, and if you do believe that the Bible does have the answers for life in it, you know, and that's your foundation, and yeah. so the, it's not a mythology plus the Bible; it's a biblical mythology. Like you, you're going at it from a standpoint of how do we make this make sense with what we believe. It allows you to ask questions that typically we just kind of bury, yeah. and then there's really interesting things that become deeply meaningful. So, like for instance. You know, uh, this year I got to go to Israel for the first time and got to stand in, I think it was Caesarea Philippi, where, where Peter is talking to Jesus and Jesus asks him, who do people say that I am? And he, and he says, you're, you're, the, you're the son of God. And then he says, you know, uh, on this rock I'll build my church and, the, church and the, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I didn't realize that he was standing in front of the, the temple to the god Pan, which was a portal to the underworld, right. it was literally the gates of hell. He yeah. was, it was a mic drop. Yeah. So when you understand that in yeah. context, you take something that is a very mythical thing, but you put it in context of what actually happened on the pages of Scripture. Like it's 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 a bad a moment for Jesus to be mic dropping. Like you know the, we're storming the gates of hell, and it's like it's it, it takes on a completely context. different meaning where you're yeah. like oh. That's much more meaningful if I just said that's a good little flannel graph story. Sure. So, like, you know, with you guys wrestling with the idea of we're going to chase our interests with a, you know, an underlying idea of it's a Trojan horse for the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, did you know exactly what you wanted this to be, or did you just kind of figure it out as you went? Was there a master plan? Oh, we just had an episode 200 come out yesterday. Congrats. We talked, we talked about it, and I think... I think there was a couple of guests that came on and totally changed the tra trajectory yeah. of the show. I think I wanted it to be a little bit more vague and when I was thinking about it, like, yeah. you know, we, we filter everything through the biblical lens, but I didn't know that people were going to straight come on the show and start dropping the gospel. I don't know. I, I you know, growing up in the, <clears throat> the church and the Christian community, you get a little jaded, you yeah. know, we all have our moments where we had a bad situation or a bad run in or, people that are kind of abusive or yep. some narcissists in the church. Sure, 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 yeah. And so there was a part of me that didn't, I didn't want it to feel churchy, Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to remove my faith from the conversation. Yep. I wanted it to feel organic and real. As long as it's real and organic and it's not like something I feel like we're, someone's selling something yep. or then, then I'm in. But I think when we brought on uh, Dr. Laura Sanger, she kind of was talking about this, from like a completely like like oh, this is a worldwide systematic you know this Genesis six event is is more than just these hybrids that were supposedly created yep and I think at that point the show kind of went a whole other route and then all of a sudden we started getting messages from worship leaders and other people and I'm like oh like what we're doing is sort of scratching an itch because yep and this is kind of what something I wanted to say a second ago is that. You know, I saw technology sort of change the music industry where one person can like bring the whole thing yeah. down. You know, the dude creates Napster and the whole industry crumbles. And I think in a way, podcasting is like two dudes who are willing to talk about stuff and can produce an entire show just in their basements and put it out in the world. Yeah. Can bring down these this system that doesn't want to talk about the weird stuff. And it's we're just lucky to have been kind of having conversations in a time where you can do that. Yeah. You you know, there's no congregation that's going to shut us down. There's no, like, elders are going to be like, you can't talk about that on Sunday. Right. And we're not going to lose funding or we're not going to be ostracized mm -hmm. or kicked out of the church or have somebody say, you can't talk about that. So the downside is you never know. Like, you know, people can take it way too serious. Yeah. And they think that we are, like, the mouthpiece of all this. <laughs> and we're like, no, we're just having conversations. We don't well, know. Yeah, that, that or, they, or they, they will peg us and say, like, this, somehow this is our theology. Yeah. You know, and it's like, all we do is interview people and let them tell their story. Yeah. Ironic, unironically, on a storyteller's uh -huh. podcast here, we, we do our best. Of that. We're not going to let somebody, like, you know, disparage Christianity or Christ yeah. at all. But yeah. at the same time... We're trying to provide context and conversation around pretty well, a lot of unanswerable well, questions. I mean, I mean, you see the same phenomenon going on right now with the chosen. You know what Dallas and the team have done with the chosen is the idea of, um, you know, a lot of people will accept that as the 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 unknown, you know, fifth, you know, gospel, you know, in the Bible is the chosen. It's like it's it's quotable and it's like and it's somehow that it's inspired. And it's not. It's but what it is is what Dallas has done is emotional archaeology. Right. That if he can go back and ask the questions of if these were real people that hadn't read the rest of the book and the only person that knew what was really happening was Jesus, 
then you know what must they have felt what what might have they been going through what right. are the you know, guesses and, and filling in the hum, human kind of ideas to it. Those are questions but, we can't answer. You know, there, there's no, there's yeah. no way to say like that Matthew was on the spectrum. Right. But, you know, when you look at somebody who's hyper detailed with the lineage of Christ and he was a tax collector, that, sure, that, that could be an interesting entry point to, to explore. So, you know, I think with you guys asking the questions and just exploring the possibilities, it kind of does a little bit of that, and you know. Yeah, and, and I think Dallas runs into the same kind of thing, right? Where the people say, "Well, look at your your theology is all wrong," and he's like, "This isn't theology; it's storytelling. This, this is storytelling, and we're actually just trying to provide some context and 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 suggest suggest th this yeah. could be this could have been how it is. And we don't. This is an unanswerable question unless we have Matthew here to interview. Exactly. Us. In the same way, we're. I, I think ultimately Nate and I are are just like these are conversations worth happening because if we don't have these conversations and attempt to answer these questions. We have the world is more than willing to disciple us in their belief of mm -hmm. what the, of what we should think about UFOs, what we should think about sure. creatures, what we should think about supernatural experiences. Yep. And they'll tell you what to think. Right. And they're more than willing to do that. Yep. And if the church, by and large, and Christians and when I say the church is Christians aren't willing to engage some of these questions and talk about how do we contextualize this within our faith, within within the biblical context, which is the basis for our faith. How, if we don't do that, um then like i said a few minutes ago like some people will see some of these things like the alien phenomenon as a disqualifier for your faith mm -hmm. and guess what there's tons in scripture where we can point to and say perhaps look at this look at that we don't know much about the ang the angelic race yeah, or my angels deal. you yeah, know window into that and then the other side is that is that, is that the world's offering their own interpretation right yeah. ancient aliens and and, yep. and a ton of folks that are in the secular world will say this is what you should believe or yeah. they get in the new age movements exploding you yep, know right but I, I think one thing we've said a lot on our, our show is that you know what we found is there are a lot of the theology podcasts who are afraid to get paranormal mm -hmm. and there's a lot of paranormal podcasts who are afraid to get the theological We're afraid of god yeah and so we kind of married these two things and i think we found a we sort of found a, a vein and i think the story of christianity what we found on our show is it's really a war between two kingdoms. Yeah. You have the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of heaven, right? Yeah. And we're kind of caught in the middle of this war. Yeah. And, and you know, we sort of mythologized everything. Yeah. But really, it's more like the Lord of the Rings than we can even imagine. Huh. Like, we are a character and there are other creatures. Huh. There are many blurry creatures, as we found. And when you start to outline these creatures and give data, because I think one of the things we do on our show is we give data. Yeah. We bring on experts who say, look, Here's the data. It's not just sometimes we bring on encounter stories. Sure. But we're like, look, these people are part of the government. They have seen these right. craft. They have touched the craft. Huh. They have the medals. They worked on these programs. They've been in the underground military bases. They've interacted with this stuff. Yeah. And and I think that's the hard one of the things that really rattles Christians is there's physical evidence for yeah. Sasquatch, UFOs. They have they have these things. Right. They come from somewhere. There's some sort of production line somewhere <laughs> and then we read the biblical narrative that like angels were eating they were bread of heaven you know and they're showing up on they're rolling into town somehow yep. and they're walking and, and they're going, getting from point a to point b somehow yeah and supposedly in genesis 6 they lust after some women and take them from themselves yeah and then there's this whole like you know thousands of years of of the sort of the fallout well, of that. And, and that and that's part that that part's you know fascinating too because if you explore some of that uh, you know, just the idea of this half breed race that was created, and like, is that where Greek mythology and the legend comes 100%. out of? And the idea yes, of absolutely demigods and different things like that. I mean, where did those legends come from? Yeah. Well, did it come from a reality that happened prior to the flood? I and mean, it's like, it's so, it's there's a really interesting, you know, that once you start pulling at the thread, I don't know, that undermine your undermines your faith. It just it just fills a lot of the what ifs and, and it connects dots, right? Because you have if you have this universal sort of meta story right which exists right. across all these right. civilizations and cultures then you as nate said it's it's a lot of the data right you have you have thousands of data points um you know as mike heiser late mike heiser said on our show you know pretty famously for in our world like just one of those is true hmm. then you break the whole paradigm and you have to figure out how does this fit within the fences i've drawn around my faith mm -hmm. and so when you're talking about yeah like demigods and you have pantheons and you have these things really make a lot of sense now. If you grab them from mythos and you pull them into your worldview, these things make a lot of sense. If you look at the biblical narrative and you say, oh, wow, we have this 
heavenly rebellion. And we have these angels that left their their post, essentially, is what the New Testament says. And, and they took wives, and then their offspring were the Nephilim, right? Which is a is a hybrid race. Then you have these these were the men of renown. Yeah. yeah. Right? Then you go, wow, okay, this sounds a lot like what happens in, in the Greek mythology when you have Hercules. And, and just like gods. every story, every every civilization has the flood story. You mm-hmm. know, there's these truths that, you know, if you listen, even even the guys that aren't, you know, don't put God at the top of their paradigm, their pyramid of, of how they see truth, they see all of it. They see the ancient construction. They see the megalithic yeah, it's culture. It's Hancock, right? Yeah. That's, it's it's The Graham. golden age. And then ancient aliens guys are often quoting from the Bible as well. Mm. So they see it, but wow. they just don't put, you know, God at the top of it. Right. I think ingrained in the DNA is this desire of, of humans to understand their creator. And so like when I watch a movie like Interstellar, yeah. And and I watch what Christopher Nolan wrote and it gets to the point to the end where I feel like he laid out the beautiful proof intellectually of the existence of God. Mm-hmm. And he gets this like it's a it's it's you know uh, a five-dimensional being that communicates through time and space and uses gravity in order to communicate the ultimate truth he wants to communicate is love. And uh and so the idea when it gets to that point it's like oh my gosh, you just laid out the and then he doesn't want to make the jump to the natural conclusion and he says it's a bait and switch. well it must yeah. be us we get that technology in the future where we can come back but take that out of it up until the last five minutes of that movie i mean I, I feel like so i just feel like there is something in those questions that you guys are asking that probably is very attractive to those curious skeptics that kind of step in you know so does, does do those breadcrumbs lead to to conversations about faith with people kind of coming to faith through listening oh, yeah. to your podcast yeah, that's one of the more surprising things I think, Nate, is that the emails, the yeah. emails that we get people that are just like, "Hey, this, like, I, I found Christ. Like, mm-hmm. I was looking for answers, and I, I mean, these are we get them weekly, and which is not to pat our own backs. It's not. I mean, you can only hope as a Christian that you're that what you do points to Jesus, right? And that's 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 all of our hopes. And, but I, I think that is surprising considering where our podcast, where it is. I just don't think I ever thought like people would be like, "Hey, I, this." brought me back to God or this I've started to read my Bible or this is the only thing that me and my husband can talk about and it's saved our marriage these are real po- it's wow. and I don't this is not to like puff us up this is it's the most humbling thing there that I, I think that happens through this is that somehow you know in all this weirdness the Christ is 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 still where we want to point people and I think it just behooves at the end, you know at the end of the day it behooves just the, our need for Christ and, and the hope there right mm-hmm. because it, the dark is very dark yeah and sometimes we end up in those places, and and I, you know, some of that stuff. <laughs> sometimes I think Nate and I, because of the conversations we have, put ourselves sort of in the crosshairs for, for you know, yeah, for spiritual warfare. You want whatever you want, whatever you think about. I mean, you that told term. me a couple of those things. Yeah, it's like those crazy. Things, those are these things that happened to me, and so you could say, "Well, Luke's making this stuff up," but it's not. not. It's this is what happened to me. Like, and um, but I also think that the flip side of that coin. Is that if you are not a threat to the kingdom of darkness, then the darkness has no, has no, no reason to be after you. Like right. you're, not, you're not threatening their dominion. You're not threatening their territory. Hmm. You're not you're you're not threatening their exposure. Wow. And there's a powerful responsibility in some of that, I think. And and in some ways, it's the. And I've talked about this on the show before, but it's the Sun Tzu with the art of war, right? Like mm-hmm. I, Ephesians six is not to participate in the in the things of darkness, but rather expose them. And and then Sun Tzu in the Art of War says, if you know yourself and know your enemy, you're going to be victorious. Mm. And I think sometimes we walk around and you know we focus on knowing ourselves or knowing or knowing God and, and ignoring some of the what is the strategy of the darkness, right? And um, well, I, I think you can, people can get overtly and, and overly focused on that. Yeah, and that's not healthy either. It's balance. But I do think there's a balance to being like, hey, we live in a in a fallen world, with, right. and there's there is a reality to some of this darkness. And if we want to put our heads in the sand um, and pretend like it doesn't exist. That's that's a lot of people's preferred knee-jerk reactions. Just be like, I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. going to address I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to address this. I don't, I'd rather just pretend like this isn't real. But whether you pretend it's real or not, it still is real. Yeah. yeah. And you still live in that reality. As Nate said, we live in this world at war. We're born into a world at war. It's an ancient war that continues. Uh, we know how it ends, which is the, the wonderful thing about putting your, your faith and your hope in Christ is you know how this ends. 
Mm-hmm. And we have the, the end has been written. Um, but we're in the middle, middle somewhere of, the, of this going on. I mean, maybe middle end depends on, on what your eschatology is. But, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this, this is, uh, I think, and to Nate's point too, to bring this kind of full circle, I think people that have these experiences with something weird that that don't have a place, the, the crazy thing is that when they come on the show and tell their story, um, without fail, there are a number of people that respond yeah. that have had a similar, and it, and it is this freeing of people to be able to talk about and process mm. their own Gives experiences, them a com- right? It's like, like therapy almost, yeah. right? Yeah. In a weird way, yeah. It's hmm. like the, you know, it's like the director's cut, you know? Yeah. Like, let's just do the, let's, Let's do it the way we want to do it. Yeah, and the podcast allows you to do that. Well, I mean, with, with that, with the you know, the, doing what you want to do, um, philosophically, with with what you guys are doing, I find it very interesting. Like people finding their voice. Like for us, you know, when we first started, you know, faith film was still coming out of its infancy and infancy, and we really hadn't figured out what this was going to become. Like left and, behind, yeah, it? yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like stuff like that. I won't, I won't. Uh, <laughs> Nicholas Cage on a plane, but um, yeah, uh, but but as we were trying to figure that out, you know, we talked to a lot of people that were doing it, and we're just like, we don't know how to do what you guys do, and in a, a couple of them really encouraged us, like, don't do what we do, find your voice and tell your stories, and so we tried on different hats, you know, I guess our version of a band and a sports pro- podcast, we tried on different things that you know were. But when we st- stepped into the movie Woodlawn, it was a true story. And then when we did that movie, it was the first time we were like, oh, this is what we do. We know exactly how to do this. We do true stories. And that became our voice. It's like it became an entry level to the gospel to people that were kind of skeptics by telling people's experience without it being like it doesn't feel preachy. Uh, and and we, we even tested the limits of that. Like so we're on the, the same team as we said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So we, and we even tested the limits of that like uh, – you know, with, with, with Jesus Revolution is, you know, when my brother and, and Brent McCorkle went off to do that movie, it was like, this is pretty overt, but it was a moment in time where Christianity was pretty punk rock. So it's like, it, it worked, but we found our story to tell, we found our voice. So for you guys, you know, with the interest that you have, with you having this kind of childhood, you know, obsession with the idea of Bigfoot and trying to figure out like, is, is that real? And then you guys having your experience dabbling around with podcasts, Stumbling into where all of a sudden all those ingredients combine. What's that moment like? What? How did you find your voice? And then there's a lot of anger behind what you're saying. So like you know the difference between rage and anger is rage is based in fear. Anger is based on passion. So there's a lot of anger of like I have something to say and I want to say it. And there's things that we weren't allowed to ask in church growing up that we want to give people. So f- how how was it finding your voice and having the anger to actually say something? Mm. Yeah, I love it because a lot of people. You know, a lot of my friends have gone down these progressive rabbit holes where yeah. they... Especially in band world. Yeah. Where, like, the only thing Jesus came to talk about was social justice, and that's it. And that's all he was. They've stripped everything from the story, and all the power, and they've sort of just turned Jesus into this nice, nice guy. And uh, you're just supposed to love everything and everyone, no matter what. And right. I think you grow up with these crazy stories of, like, Noah's flood, and and you go, what is that? Or, you know... Sodom and Gomorrah or Tower of Babel. Right. And you're like, are these just fake stories? And I think yeah. a lot of people come to these conclusions in the progressive church that, yeah, this is all just the way that they saw things. It's all my, it's all my thought. Christ is this consciousness oh, allegory. in yeah. you. And yeah. it becomes this very like, no, 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 these are characters in the story. These things happen. Loses its teeth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we, have, we went to Peru and we saw these things. They built these megalithic structures that defy, you know, human engineering yeah, today. Exactly. What? Or the pyramids or anything. Yeah. <laughs> what knowledge did they have? Where did it come from? And I think we've been trying to sort of blow the whistle and use some of that anger to be like, this golden age happened. The things in your Old Testament happened. These characters in the story happened. You know, right. these are real stories that we tell ourselves are just sort of fake or retold uh-huh. or mythology, like, like we talked about earlier. But for me, you know... Um, I grew up in the just stifled in the Christian school where I asked questions and didn't get good answers. Mm. And you, you, I never gave up on my faith, but I definitely was jaded a long, a long time. Mm. We're That's so good. afraid of content. We're afraid of we're afraid of everything, and we come with we have a very fear driven. And I think we just let's not be afraid of these stories. If mm. if these things, if, like you said, these stories are true, let's talk about them mm. because they fit. 
you know, like, and I think we don't let fear drive what we do. I think a lot of the church does and I wish they wouldn't and get out of that mindset. But, and I think for me, it just scratches an itch of like, just being very curious and having this insatiable desire to learn. And when you get to sit down and, and do interviews and, and also I'm just I'm a absolute free speech absolutionist. Right. So, yeah. so I, I love the idea of, of learning and, and being and staying curious and then allowing people their platform to present their 10,000 hours of, of, of research and experience right. into these things. And then taking all that and in some ways, you know, spitting out the bones, the chewing the meat, spitting out the bones, right? Like right. You, you're like, what? And I love that. Like, and I say this all the time, it's not trope. Like, I think Nate and I would continue to do this podcast, like whether in, if, it, if no one listened, if it was just our huh. folks and our friends who were like, we're like, oh, we got to listen to their podcast because, you know, Luke and Nate are doing this cute little thing, right? <laughs> kind of, kind of still, a blurry creatures, Wayne's world. Yeah, we still yeah, want to have this. These, <laughs> we, yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. We, we still want to have these conversations. I think we still would if, uh -huh. if people would come and talk to us about it because I think selfishly and personally that there's this desire to un to understand and and as you said earlier in the interview like as you said like we have this there's this human element to us that really wants to understand our creator and understand these the you know who god is and and maybe why things happen and why things that have happened and to and to dig deeper and to, and you know to know our bibles and as you say context is so important i, I think yeah. when you stand at before the, the gates of hell at, yeah, at Mount Hermon exactly. in, in Caesarea Philippi, it, it makes this whole thing, it's not allegory. And it's not close to where the disciples and Jesus were. They and It was intentionality, as Mike Heiser talked about on our show. Like There's this physical geography and this cosmic geography that, that, that matter. Hmm. right? He's Jesus is going there intentionally. It's because physically this is the place where, uh, where the gates of hell are. Physically this is the place where traditionally the angels arrived at earth in genesis 6 but wow. it, and it wasn't superstitious they weren't superstitious about that spot there was something going on there Man. That, that manifested in reality mm. so physical and cosmically these things mattered and christ was intentional and then peter isn't the rock you know yeah, that's how no. the, that's the interpretation right yeah and then that that sticks in minds for that for hundreds of years after that yeah and uh, these 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 places the Valley of Shadow of Death is a real place. It's yeah. full of 10,000 10, plus dolmens, and it was about veneration of the dead. It was literally a place where the dead mm -hmm. ancestors were venerated, and they walked through it. It's a real place. It's not just this allegory like, yeah. man, I'm going through tough times, and God's my staff. Like, this it's not is just real, poetic speech. No. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's not iconography. It's, it's real. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know. I was at a barbecue yesterday, and, and we were talking about the story of the Witch of Endor and mm -hmm. Samuel and yeah. Saul. And a lot of Christians interpret that as like, you know, that was all demonic, but you know, Samuel comes back. Yeah, it, it scared her. It scared the witch. Yeah, it scared her because she was and like, he, "Oh, it's really the dude." <laughs> yeah, and he gives her, he gives us all a prophecy. You know, so you're going to die tomorrow, and then he does, right? And you know, how you read these stories is, you 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 know, you grow up with these church stories, but it's almost like we grow up with no context. So we interpret however we want, right? But. Ancient, or you just kind of skim over like, oh, that's weird. In the inspired scripture, they lived in a reality that was you didn't separate the natural from the supernatural. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a shared reality paradigm they lived in. And we but we read it oftentimes, broad brush, obviously, in the West in, in a way that's very much from a rational, non-supernatural paradigm. And then we try to interpret the scripture that way, and it just doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work because that's not who it, we, it wasn't written to us. Yeah. Number yeah. one, it wasn't. It was written to Yeah. You know, to ancient Hebrews thousands of years ago, that understood, as we said, re were, were read and re understood all this requisite knowledge that we don't have in some ways, unless we go back and we read it in that way. Understanding, well, and, but I think it, and it's even even step beyond that. It's a confidence in Scripture. Right. If there's a confidence in Scripture, you can ask all these questions and not be yes. afraid that you there's can... not something to explore in the page that 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 makes. Yeah, it I'm make saying sense. that like some of my, a lot of my friends don't want to accept the Noah no Noahic flood. They don't like this. They don't understand it. There's no or the con conquest of Joshua, right? right. Yeah. It's a, how could you serve a genocidal or God? even Sodom and Gomorrah? How yeah. did they destroy these? God destroys cities and this and that. But I grew up with this story of humans were bad and God had to wipe them out. Mm. But what we've uncovered is that humans almost went extinct. Yeah, it, 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 the, much the, different story. The darkness was trying to breed them out. Yeah. We, so yeah, much more epic. I mean, it was I mean, very similar to Lord of the Rings. They're breeding orcs. It was like. Yes, you know that right. idea of of it wasn't a human race, and then and then you look at like the flood wiping that out, and then the idea of 
little pockets of trying to start that again. Like, oh, yeah. where does a, a, a giant like Goliath come from? Right, and his, and, and, and and his four brothers yeah. and King Agabashan. And you yeah. know, giants post-flood, how'd that happen? Yeah, yeah. exactly. But I, I think it makes a lot more sense then, right? Because you go, well, look at Gen 3 is the first prophecy. It's God himself saying that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, right? It's yep. a prophecy for Jesus. He's trying to breed him out. So he's like, well, you know, we st we stopped that? Yeah. We don't have any more humans. This exactly. is pretty easy, right? This, yeah. In, in some ways, that, that the thinking of the darkness, we'll, just, we'll stop it. And God said, that's not going to happen. Yep. And Noah was, you know, pure in his... And it makes the whole thing make a lot more sense. You know, I think, which, is, you know, and we could go on for hours about uh, all of those things because you guys got 200 episodes worth <laughs> of material yeah. to pull from. Yeah. You talk about your 10,000 hours. Are, have you been surprised to see how the podcast has exploded? Yeah. yeah. Big time. And I, mean, I, I mean, you guys have your own like blurry con now. You're taking trips to Peru and other places. Mm -hmm. and There's Bible studies that have popped up. People are, we just had our first blurry wedding. Some people met through the podcast and got, got married. married. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Dude. I, I, oh I think I'm, I'm just, it's amazing. It's just I mean, it, it's just such a, it's gratitude that like, I'm always just like, God, use me how you want, you know, mm -hmm. and whatever that. it is. And, and I, and it, it's, and you know, sense of humor because you didn't think it'd be like a you know quasi bigfoot podcast that would be the way <laughs> yeah. that guys like i want to use this and, you and gotta just, get out of your own you're way. a pretty big dude and you got a hairy face so right. you're gonna built for it yeah but, i guess so know. right it's, it stays on brand right yeah if you if you need an extra <laughs> I know, in one of your on. movies come on and we say we're too dumb all way. the time i don't want us to get in the way of what he wants to do right man that's and, fantastic and it's hard though it is yeah. we all have our ego and we all yeah. have we all have we all want to control right mm -hmm. and so it's like a it's a balance of, okay, I'm, I'm going to care about this project and I'm not going to just let anything happen, but I'm also not going to kill it and get mm -hmm. in its way. So I think we, like I, t I texted Luke yesterday, I'm like, dude, I don't want anything to ever get between you and me because that's what this is. And that's cool. I, if there's ever a problem, just let me know. I, cause I, I think in the band world, you know, you see it in creative partnerships all the time. Mm -hmm. Stupid stuff gets in the way, ego gets involved, money gets involved, and then it's yeah. over. So I'd rather have 50% of something than 100% of nothing. And I learned that in the band, and I, and I think Luke's been through similar situations where it's like, man, everything falls apart, and when people just, their egos and their... Little did involved. you know that we got you in the same room for uh, Luke to tell you that he has a problem with you, but... <laughs> yeah, really? Go ahead, Luke. Oh, dude, just, that's fine. I know he does, but... <laughs> I've been holding a grudge against I'm you. crazy. I'm the crazy guy. I'm always like, dude, let's... Dude, this. Uh, but I, I love that mentality, you know, and, and I do, and I love the mentality of being able to kind of just find find your voice and then subversively to use it for the kingdom of god and i think that's really what the podcast is about is we want to find storytellers that are unique in their own lane that are telling stories and they have an underlying why that's the same but the method is completely different cool. yeah. and yeah. so it's I mean, not the kingdom though, th right? that's exciting yeah. you know and i think that's where i get excited when i see people that are like not just coming at it from a standpoint of what else is working and how do we do that but coming from like what do we have to say and how do we have an opportunity to say it and it's a completely different Dude, I think that's why it works, though. I mean, this is the thing, right? You can look at, I think you can try to replicate what a lot of people have done or, or are doing, right? And, and, but I, I feel like what you said is, is, is that's it, right? It, it's it. Let's find our voice. Let's find what we want to do. And let's, let's do that because we feel like it's important. Yeah. And then if it resonates, it resonates. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But we're doing what we, what we feel like this is, this it's is our heart to do, right? It's yeah, authenticity. And, and so I think that's, that's the kingdom, right? It, it is that what you're doing and making film and what we're doing in podcasts and what people, uh, millions of people are doing. And it, if you're, if you find a role and not to use like a movie, but you find your role and you, and you, and you play that role, right? But you're all, as you say, you're all working for the same, same goal, same team, yeah. like the same, the same mission. And there's yeah. something beautiful in that. I think like, because ultimately it's about, it's about people, like people are the currency of heaven, right? Well said, bro. So that's well, what matters. Well, to, to wrap things up and just to kind of finish up, I, I want to finish with something really important that we kind of started with. And that's the idea that so much of your brand is based on 80s nostalgia. <laughs> so, like, and I'm all in on that. So, like, back when I used to mix films at Universal uh, in L.A., I would always take my golf cart on my lunch break or my coffee break, and I would go to the Back to the Future Town Square, and I'd sit there and I'd have my lunch sitting on the – the town hall steps, the, the courthouse. The clock tower. Yeah, I would just right there in the clock tower, I would be sitting on the steps eating my lunch. Like, it was incredible. I loved it, just absorbed the energy from that place. So if we're going to have a healthy debate and we have to pick only one movie each that is the best movie of the 80s, 
Like you have to, you have to, you can only pick one. Like what would it be? And it can be personal. Like for it can't me, can't be Back to the Future though. No, it can't be Back to the Future. That's low hanging fruit. <laughs> so, so, uh, okay. but I guess it could be Back to like the Future. Rad. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, uh, well, yeah. see, see, I was on set uh, for Imagine, and there was somebody that was brought on set to shadow me for the day because she wanted to learn to direct. It's an actress. She was in her, you know, early fifties, and I'm not paying attention. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, no problem. She can. So she's on set, and the whole time I'm directing, I keep looking over at her and like, she looks familiar. She looks familiar. And then all of a sudden, I was like you're the girlfriend from the last starfighter. And she was like, yeah, that was me. And I got tongue tied. Like I could be around <laughs> any other actor, big movie stars, like yeah. put Brad Pitt on the set. I'm fine. But I couldn't talk. Cause I'm like, you're the, you're, you're the girl that you're the, cause I was like the 12 year old boy all over again. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's like, it was deeply meaningful for me. Last like, I, like mm. so what is that meaningful movie for each of you guys? And yeah. Why? I mean, obviously, you know, we've, we've, we've ripped off a lot of, memes from back to the future and stuff but what is it about back to the future that you gravitate towards i mean it was one of the first real like movies i watched with my my siblings and uh -huh. it was just so i mean was, everything was so good from from the opening shots about all the clocks and everything mm -hmm. it was just they made it they made the perfect film mm -hmm. right i mean just the original it was just and then just the, the delorean and all the they just Huey had Lewis, all the, the news not wanting his name involved or writing the title track because that was going to suck. You heard that story? Uh -uh. So I have it. He wrote the title track, right? Like we in the very beginning. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he didn't want his He's name attached judge. to it. He's the he judge. It was be horrible. He thought it was going to be a terrible movie. That wouldn't be. It would be a big flop. So wow. He didn't, but and then it ended, of course, being huge, right? But he and he played a part, and he didn't want his name in the credits. That's he, awesome. It's not in the credits anywhere. That's awesome. And so that, that's yeah, anyway. that's and, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. I think that's too, too easy. Somewhere between uh, maybe like Ferris Bueller Day Off or yep. or Princess Bride. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Oh, Either man. one of those, you can't go wrong. I can quote Princess Bride from front to back. <laughs> I saw it so many times. I, I literally can. That oh, man, Raiders of the Lost Ark was. Dude, I remember watching. I remember when I that's saw mine. it and when I watched. That's it. mine. Like like there's like, there's eighties movies that you go back and they fall apart, and that but but there's a nostalgic value to it that you go back like i watched the last starfighter now i'm like ah oh, man i remembered it so epic in my head as a kid but you watch raiders and raiders holds it stands. up yeah it stands because it didn't take itself too seriously but it was just good cinema yeah like it was just so many iconic moments. you're a kid and it's adventure yeah. and it's just like this fantastical but real world like where you're like and my uncle was an archaeologist i remember where i watched it. i was in a trailer at my uncle, who was an archaeologist, oh, dude. <laughs> real archaeologist, in in taught at UCLA and did all these digs in the, in South America, and I remember my parents didn't want us to watch it. So when my so we were staying with my aunt and uncle, they let us watch Raiders, and my uncle's an archaeologist and he's talking to me about archaeology. Huh. I can remember sitting because they were building that he was building he was a wild man. He still right. is a wild man, but he was building his entire house on his own by hand. Wow, he's that guy. But I remember sitting there with my uncle in a little trailer they were living in next to the house they were building, watching Raiders and being like. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm not supposed to watch this. And then also, I don't remember why my parents didn't want to see it, but I watched it anyway with my uncle Nelson. You know, whenever I can, you know, cast one of these actors. So like, uh, for me, like it was the Goonies. And uh, when I first, uh, uh, I have, I've had Sean Astin in two of my films. And so Sean on the set of the first film took the whole crew to the side and it led us in the Goonies pledge and made us all honorary. So I'm, so <laughs> no I'm, way. I'm, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm an honorary Goonie. That's and amazing, so I bro. tested it out because... Um, uh, about a year ago, uh, my son's 15, and I, I showed him the Goonies for the first time. I, I took a, a picture of us watching it in the theater and at, at my house, and I sent it to Sean, and I said, I'm a horrible dad, don't judge me. I'm just now introducing my son to the Goonies. And so he texts me back. He's like, remember, you are a Goonie. And I'm like, yes, yes. I'm going to frame that for the wall. I almost said but that one, too. It's a like, story of yeah, Oregon, man. Yeah. That, that was one I was thinking as well. Goonies, yeah. Is, yeah, I found you when I really... It's, it's definitely like a little bit more... It's just like... A little bit more, you know, swings towards the kids' movie. Yep. But yeah, it's funny because I was thinking about ripping off part of the Goonies for the opening of the next Blurry Con. That's yeah. cool. I already had an but idea. Karate Kid. <laughs> karate Kid. You yeah. want to bring in Sean Astin? I let thought, me know. I, I, I thought, <laughs> yeah, I thought, uh, dude, we're gonna. Yeah, that's the hard. That's the thing. I want to get all these '80s stars on our uh -huh. show and talk about weird blurry stuff, but totally unrelated. But the Neverending Story was pretty good. Too. That one, yeah, like. They definitely captured something in that first one that they couldn't redo in the 
yep. the, the other films they tried to make. But yeah, there's Falcor, the, the the dragon dog yeah. thing. Yeah, it was that amazing. scared me. That movie yeah. was terrified me. The, the wolf scene yeah. where she's chasing and she's got the horse. I mean, yeah. I don't think I've ever cried as much when she's trying to get her horse yeah. through the mud. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. was so sad, and that's still so sad. If you think yeah. about one of the saddest po- moments in eighties history, yep. it's her getting her horse and it yeah. just sinks. Oh my gosh. Anyway, but yeah. there's okay. there was just some some magic. <laughs> there was some magic in the eighties. There was. It was. It, it was it, like the tail it was like technology was there. Uh-huh. But it didn't take over. Yeah. It still had a lot of imagination. It was like it. a it was more of a there tool. A, yeah, there was this childlike wonder that doesn't exist now when you can just do everything with a computer. Well, um, we'll we, we can go down this rabbit hole for forever. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to introduce it late because I knew if I did it early, yeah. it, the whole podcast. Was yeah, smart. Smart. Yeah. But guys, I like I, I'm a huge fan. Obviously, somebody needs to think about doing a movie around Blurry World. Uh, yeah. to be continued. Someone should. Yeah. Somebody yeah. should. Uh, yeah. Somebody but should. Uh, uh, you know, for us, we're big fans here. You know, not just because of the success you guys are having, but because I love the anger underneath that drives the why. You know, there is a storyteller's heart there uh, to complete the dots and connect the dots in order to highlight what you believe, not undermine it. And Mm. so, Mm. um, you know, I think at Kingdom, we just recognize good storytelling and what you guys are doing. And I do. I also like the idea of the medium being able to change, like the, the, the method can change. So like, you know, podcasting wasn't even a thing, you know, when we were kids. And so the idea that this new method comes along and it's being harnessed to tell really interesting stories like that excites me because i just look at the future of what we're able to do as christians and just harness new new opportunities so um so we're fans around here we're excited mm-hmm. about what you guys are doing i think it's just getting started so yeah. uh luke and nate thanks for being on the show yeah thanks, thanks for having man. us it's fun man all right yeah appreciate you guys roll that time cop roll, <laughs> roll it <laughs> I just want to thank my guests, Nate Henry and Luke Rogers. These guys are fantastic. Um, just, uh, you know, A-plus individuals uh, that have become dear friends. And uh, so excited to see where their brand continues to grow. This blurry verse that's kind of spinning off of their podcast is fascinating to watch. And I think as a storyteller, what it does for me, their story, um, what it inspires me is being uniquely crafted for what you do. And I think by both these guys, Nate and Luke being naturally curious, um, thinking that a lot of these things they were interested in, there was no eternal value. And then all of a sudden God flipping the switch and being like, here's your platform. Um, I think that has a lot to say too, about just a lot of times as creatives, we just say, I don't see anybody else out there that looks like me um, or, or, be- or, or, or sees the world like I do. And I think initially, whatever is your obstacle in your career has the potential to then be turned and become, you know, your platform, your message, your voice, your audience. And you see time after time, sometimes somebody comes out and they're unique and they talk about what a challenge it was to be heard for a while. And then all of a sudden, just the the switch gets flipped and you're like, that's what I have to say. So just be encouraged as uh, other storytellers uh, to just, uh, you know, be diligent to find your voice and God will make it make sense at the right time. And uh, we want to thank you guys for watching and we'll see you on the next episode of The Storytellers. The Storytellers is a Kingdom Story Company production. It is produced by Nick Carey with production assistance from Ben and Justin Bailey. Our executive producers are Kevin Downs and Brandon Gregory. Social media for the show is run by the team at Troops and Allies and our music is Twisted Rooster by Tommy Prophet. Special thanks to Jaron Weatherly, Evan Johnston, and our entire team at Kingdom Story Company. We have so many exciting guests coming up this season. To ensure you don't miss any of them, subscribe to The Storytellers for free on YouTube at Kingdom Story Company or wherever you listen to podcasts. For exclusive first looks at our upcoming films, behind the scenes content, and invitations to advanced screenings, Join the conversation as a Kingdom Insider at KingdomStoryCompany.com and follow us at Kingdom Story Company across all platforms. As always, thanks for joining Andrew Irwin and his friends on The Storytellers.